And so we've talked about uh, Paul calling himself the chief of all sinners. We've talked about the dangers of growing up in the church and thinking that, oh, I'm not as bad as them. You know, my life is pretty good. I don't do bad things, and therefore I should go to heaven. But that's not why we go to heaven. We don't go to heaven because of the good things we do. We go to heaven because of, this, of, of the sacrifice and the salvation that is found in Jesus Christ. It is only through Jesus Christ that we can stand acceptable before God. 2 Corinthians 5 reminds us of that, as we said. Now we're finishing off, as I said, 1 Timothy. I just want to finish the first chapter. I want to read a few verses. I stopped verse 17. He's going to come back in our conversation. So I want to just finish that off. And then the beginning of chapter 18. It says, sorry, the beginning of chapter 2. It says, Now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, to God who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. And then he tells him, This charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, having faith and a good conscience, which some having rejected concerning the faith have suffered shipwreck. And then he gives examples. Uh, one of the verses that comes up later, he, he talks about the importance of how we dress, right? He goes right into that in chapter 2. And, and it's important how we dress how we live, and all of that. In chapter 2, he talked about, um, you know, he, he addresses specifically women in that chapter. But of course, we are told later on, he addresses men and how they treat their wives and how they carry themselves. So both men and women are addressed in, in different contexts there. I only bring that up partly because that is a hot-button issue and question of dress code and all of that. But see, again, the Bible gives us direction. We want to honor the Lord in all that we do, in how we carry ourselves, in how we dress. And if you ever have questions about that, talk to someone who's, you know, an older, for the women, talk to the older women. Uh, for the men, definitely catch uh, one of the older men and ask them questions about issues that you feel, okay, this might be getting too personal, I have a question. Talk to them, share your heart out on that, and then the Bible says that, you know, the older women can lead in those issues and, and to the younger women, and then the men should also have those opportunities with other men. So, I just remember that from chapter 2, that that is one real practical application it brings up. Because again, we live in a day and time where some days you're like, is this okay? Is that okay? Um, bring those conversations up if you have questions. And that was from First, uh, first Timothy 2, 9, 8 and 9. So we've looked at Ephesians 5, we looked at First Timothy 1, and um, the, the quick review again. First question I ask, is there anything you believe or anything that you've come in contact with that you found to be so life-changing that you wanted others to know about it? The part that I didn't add in that question is sometimes I've found that there are some things I believe so dearly that it hurts me when I see other people don't feel the same way about it. And this is in light of things that matter, okay? So, for example, I love Jesus, and I want people to know about Jesus. But when you meet someone who just treats it trivial, ah, it's no big deal, it's, kind of, it's almost painful because you want them so badly to know Jesus the way you might know him at that point. But again, it might hurt, but you just have patience and you walk with people and you, you pray and you commit them unto the Lord. But it can be tough. It can be tough when I tell people that, oh, this type of, uh, what I don't know, whatever product is the best way to go. And they don't go with it and they go with something lower. And you're just saddened by how, you know, they're living on a lower standard, you know. They drive a certain car that you're like, man, you just need to buy into what I'm saying. This car is the best and they don't get it. Things like that. That's trivial. But I'm just saying I have, some of those have affected me. I'm like, I just feel bad that he doesn't agree with me on this matter. Again, those are trivial. But when it comes to the matter of Jesus and the word and truth, that's more difficult to deal with because we cannot make light. or We cannot tr treat those things lightly. So we've talked about some of those examples. I'm sure we can think of more. Maybe later tonight, maybe later, uh, tomorrow, you'll probably think of more things that you've wanted other people to also want. And, um, but Jesus is the one that ultimately we should want people to want. So let's start with some practical steps that we can take in light of this, of how we ought to live and how to live lives that make sense. Number one, if we are to live lives that make sense, of course, we need to seek to spend time reading the Bible and seek time praying and as we learn what we learn from the Bible. Now, it's practical in that we're making time to do that. How does that play out in my life if I'm homeschooled or if I go to some school? Well, if it really means much to me, then I will try to make time to do it. And so number one, the night before I go to bed, I have a plan for the day coming up that I'm going to get up and try to read the word. And even if I'm not necessarily doing it in the morning, 
I'm going to do it at some point. The morning is generally, uh, many people have said is the best and there's reasons why people say that. But if somebody for whatever reason works an overnight shift and decides to read their Bible later in the day, it's not like they've committed a sin. But the main thing is, am I making time to read the word? When I love someone, I make time to spend with that person. When I, when, you know, you talk about family at Christmas time, people are like, oh, we're going to spend time as a family. Well, that's great because we love one another. Well, if we love the Lord and if we love Jesus, don't we want to read about what he has to say? Don't we want to read about what his word has to teach us? So the first step of a di- in a diary of a child pursuing excellence is he, they make time. So I'm homeschooled and I start at 9 o'clock. Well, I'm not going to wake up at 8.45. It doesn't make sense. I make time to wake up to read his word. And some of you are like, well, I'm young. I need a lot of hours of sleep. Then go to bed early and then get up and read. And if you can't get to it, as I said, for whatever reason, well, when are you going to do it? Make some time at some point. If you make time to do something, you're more likely to do it rather than just say, you know what? If it works out, I might touch the Bible today. No, let's not use that strategy because I will tell you something about your state in life now that you might not realize you are at a stage in life where you have the most time available to you. You will almost never have the time you have available to you now until you retire. I repeat, you will almost not have as much time available to you now until you retire. Some of you will be turned 17, 18. Some people get jobs and then they do PSEO. So then they're going to school and they're working a job. And when you ask them how they're doing, they're always busy or they're always tired. Some of you don't have jobs, and some of you are not doing PSEO, so you have a lot of time. Now, I'm not saying that those who are doing those things have an excuse not to read the Word. I think it was Martin Luther or someone else who once said, oh, my days are long and getting busy. I better wake up and pray longer or something. So it's not an excuse not to pray. They should still make time. But I'm just telling you something about your state right now, and some of you maybe already have jobs, that now is the time to start keeping up on those extra scriptures. Like, keep building on this bank, because the days will come. Some of them will be intense. The busyness will come, which you have to fight off and be careful with. But now is the time to say, I need to make time. I need to build now. When a war starts, it's not at that time that the U.S. calls and says, hey, we need people to please show up at the training barracks to train people to go fight the war. It's not at that time they do that. Do you know that? There are people training right now as though though a war is going to happen. They're training right now with intensity as though they're expecting a war next year. Do you see what I'm saying? So they prepare now when everything is quiet. So you and I, the, mo- the first and most important piece of a, of a young person pursuing excellence is making the time to get in the word, to pray. And then remember what I said earlier today? Why don't you share a little bit of what you learned when you did that with your friends? Or with your, sorry, with your family and then with your friends. Here's what would be pretty cool. A bunch of young people, right? Maybe, is it David? Yep. David and Nathan and so on. Uh, and they're like, man, this Ephesians uh, book is just so cool. How about we invite some friends and let's just talk about Ephesians. And some of you probably think, well, that's awkward. Okay, well, people are doing all sorts of getting togethers. There's people getting together on video games and getting together and this and that. Well, what's wrong with just saying, guys, let's get together and read this together and just talk about it. It's going to be awkward the first time. I'll tell you for sure. You've never done it, right? It's going to look awkward. But imagine if you just did that once in a while. Imagine if you did that as a thing, and then maybe somebody invites their friends to come into that meeting. My point is there are some people that I will never see, and there are some people that your leaders here will never see. You're the only ones who will ever see them. And how are you then going to share the good news of Christ with them? What platform are you going to use to give them that story that they need to know? Or, or just to encourage them to keep growing even if they know that story already. You guys have to take charge of some things because we can't do it. And when you do some of those things, you're changing the trajectory of somebody's life, literally. Because that person now, well, the Lord is working through you to change that. That person, for example, gets saved, starts trusting the Lord, and of course grows up and raises up a family that follows the Lord. And it all started with a bunch of young people who had a Bible study in their house, or just a study talking about, uh, you know, just an opportunity to share about what they were learning as they read their Bibles in their house. And that was how this person heard, heard the truth. You never, you can't underestimate that. You can't make light of that because... There are opportunities that only you can have that we can't have, right? I can't go to Josh Rizdahl's baseball game and say, hey, guys, sit down. I want to talk to all of you. 
they don't know me, right? Uh, and same thing with some other activities some of you are doing. I don't play baseball, so I won't be showing up to the baseball game, but, but you get the point. Um, so we need to make sure that we don't, you remember what he said to Timothy, don't think of yourself as I'm just young, I can't do anything. Let's not go through the biography of some of the young people that have changed history, right? We'll keep that for another day. But there's a lot of young people that have done some things that changed the trajectory of history. And I know the, the brothers, the Harris brothers wrote a book called Do Hard Things, and they talk about the George Washington when he was young and some other people. So don't think you're too young, my friends. There's kings that, are, that were 17 and 16 and 15. So you're not too young. Um, to, 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 to bring that light to your friends. And how, what is one practical way we can do that? Just have a get together and talk about stuff that matters. One of the things I was thinking about for you guys and just in general, and tell me if I'm wrong on this, but I was just thinking about how there are not too many opportunities for young people to just have quiet. If you think about it in your world, in your life, if you don't get that down in your daily life, when will you do that? Just think about that. We, we, you guys have energy, right? There's nothing wrong with energy. But how do we help you to just sit down and reflect on life? I visited someone's house one time, and uh, they had an Xbox and a TV, and another Xbox and a TV in the same living room. And I thought, yikes. And they both had iPads and computers. I'm like, how can you ever just pause and like just think? How? I mean, this game was going, and that game was going, and then the NCAA was going to show up later. I mean, just so much going on. There is a place to just be quiet. Now, some of you are like, I don't know what that means. My phone is attached to my hands. I can't let go of it. But sometimes it's okay to just let go of it and just reflect and pause. I remember growing up, one of the things they tried to teach us was, of course, they tried to teach us the importance of getting up and praying and so on. Now, this is the most important one. That's why it's taking the longest. Some of the other ones are going to be quick. But they taught us the importance of getting up and praying and so on. And one of the things they taught us was, you know, to try and shut off your phone and put your phone away and this and that. And it was, it was okay. I mean, we, our phones were very basic back then, mostly flip phone type phones. But I just think of many young people today and they're like, no, I can't leave my phone for 30 minutes. I mean, seriously, I can't, right? And, and of course, now we have the phone addiction and there's therapy for that. But I'm not here to give you therapy for that. You can call the 1-800 number for that. But the point is, we should not be so glued to our phones that we can't just seek to have that quietness. Now, if you really want to have the quietness and look at your phone later, well, why don't you get up at 4 a.m.? Nobody's going to be calling you at that time. And you can just pray and then you can go on with your day. But again, you don't have to do it at 4. Just make the time. Everybody get number one? The diary of a young person pursuing excellence, they make time to read the Bible, to pray, and maybe take it a step further. Maybe gather with a bunch of other people. Spontaneous sometimes. Now that's even cool. Hey man, this stuff is really cool. Can, I, can we come talk about that? Sure. Boom. Spontaneous opportunity. It doesn't have to be so formal. It's like, no, I'm not talking to you. It's, Wednesday. it's not Wednesday today. Don't talk to me about Ephesians chapter 5. No, you can talk about Ephesians chapter 5 any day, anytime. That's number one. Number two, we need to find a way to address the apathy in our, in our lives and in our culture. Well, first in our lives. And that's the person who pursues excellence seeks ways to address apathy. I used to tell my students when I taught full time that the, the, uh, the smallpox that might affect your generation is apathy. What apathy did, I mean, sorry, what smallpox did to a certain generation, apathy will do to your generation. Where you just don't care. I just don't care. And nothing matters. Lack of motivation. Now, we're talking practical. So I can go really practical. And I'll give you a little bit of root. So practical sometimes is like dealing with the leaves. So I'll still go back to the root. And I'll deal with some root issues after I finish sharing the practical steps. When, when nothing matters, when things are just, eh, whatever, I don't care. You know, you ask people, some people have no passion, no direction for almost any decision. Now, for me, when it comes to trivial matters, like if someone came and said, Amos, do you like, um, well, let me think of a, a very classic example, uh, dessert. I go to some places and they ask me about dessert options. Would, would you like this strawberry cheesecake or would you like this chocolate, whatever? I tell them on matters of life that don't matter, I go both. Can I have both, please? That's what I do, right? I'm like, I don't want to think about it. Just give me both. I'll eat half and half and pass them. Now, yeah, Amos has issues with dessert. That's fine. I need to repent. I get it. But my point is, when we're faced with trivial matters, it doesn't matter, right? But then if I came to you and I'm like, hey, there's this great opportunity to help. Can you help? 
Yeah, no, maybe. So, so you're not even passionate to help. Do you see my point? You are just no motivation. I, okay, sure, I'll do it. But I'm not excited to do it, and I don't have any drive to do it. That apathy is so deep, and I've seen it grow more and more, that one of the things we need to be careful with is fighting the apathy. Well, how do I fight the apathy? Well, I can tell you some of the causes of the apathy. An overexposure and overstimulation to things that get your dopamine receptors going and all of that can actually lead you to have a form of apathy. You're just, things are boring. Your, your muscle for, let me give you an example of the entertainment. Some people are so intoxicated with entertainment that when they go to fellowship, when they go to church, sometimes they expect to be entertained because their whole world is entertainment. Right? When you're busy watching all these shows that can be watched and doing everything and all of that, it can lead you to a stage where all you want is just entertainment because you're building, yep, I have had so much of this entertainment, now I go to this and I'm like, nah, this is not entertaining enough. I need something even more entertaining. So your appetite for entertainment keeps growing. Now, again, entertainment in and of itself is not the problem. The problem is when I don't remember why I exist, so then I expect my whole life to be about fun. That's it. Is it fun? No, I'm not doing it. That's not the way to run. You need to see, is it worth doing? I'm going to do it even if it's not fun. And we need to keep that in mind. So a, a person pursuing excellence is seeking to study the word and pray. And if you do that, your apathy will most likely not be able to f- flare up. It can't because you're in the word and you're learning about Jesus and he's doing something to you. And it's hard for you to just go around like, ah, I don't care. No motivation. I'm just... No, you can't live that way if you're really reading the word and praying. You will have mission in your life. When you read the story of the woman at the well with Jesus, it then makes you realize there's some people out there that are hurting, and it changes your perspective on life. And when an opportunity comes to meet someone at the point of their need, you want to help. You see the difference? When I read the word, it's going to do something to me that will affect how I treat other people when I leave that room or that place of studying the word. So see why number one was so important? Because it trickles down into almost everything else. And if I'm reading the word, that's less time that I'm playing Xbox, right? The more we expose ourselves to excessive Xbox, excessive uh, uh, texting and all of these things, not texting with a purpose because that's important, but just texting without a purpose, which is AKA Snapchat. But anyways, you, you, you take all these things, right? The more we expose ourselves to some of these things, uh, the, 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 the more apathy can creep in. And my friends, I can't believe it. Just how people tend to be very just bland these days. Just no excitement for living. If we go back to the word and prayer, the Lord can help us there. I don't know too much about Snapchat. I, I, you just pick on it, but I, I don't know much about it. I just know that it's, the texts go away, and I just find that to be very weird. Okay, so number one was getting in the word and praying. Number two we've talked about is dealing with apathy. Number three, this is very quick. Chores at home. I'm going to bring that up because you guys have chores. Uh, your parents didn't tell me to talk about this, just so you know. So don't go home and say, Mommy, why did you tell them to tell them to talk about chores? No, they didn't tell me. But I'm just saying, as a young person pursuing excellence, as a young person living a life that makes sense, why not do your chores with excellence? Why not do your chores with diligence? What else is your job at this stage in life? What else is expected of you? We don't expect you to be bringing in the rent money or the mortgage money. We just expect you to live a life that makes sense. Like, take out the trash and let's not have a debate court proceeding because of the trash. But, but unfortunately, I've watched this happen so many times and I'm thinking, I've been longing to talk about this issue for such a long time. It's been like since 2014, 2015. And I've watched children respond to these chores like, oh, I gotta do this. It's like, what is your problem? Go do it with some diligence if you're gonna be a child pursuing excellence. Okay, that was a quick one. The next one, we need to read. We need to read the Bible. I talked about that. But we need to read good books. I need to add that. Because recognize that a child pursuing excellence, sure, he spent some time or she spent some time praying and reading the word. They've been encouraged. Apathy is being kept away. They're going out and trying to get their friends. Let's talk about all the stuff we're learning. This is exciting. Sometimes we actually ostracize people that talk about stuff that matters. Isn't that sad? I remember one girl who was excited to share and she wants to go share with somebody and they just look at her like, what's your problem? You're behaving like you're holier than us. Okay, whether or not she's holier than you, she just wanted to share what she's learning. If you're holier than her, why don't you share what you're learning? And so she got discouraged, but I think she's going to be okay. But the point is, if we are spending time in the word and prayer, if apathy is going away, if we're reducing that technology use, what is going to take up more of our time? Maybe reading good books. 
right? Just read some good books. There's a lot of good books out there. I can't believe the availability of good books in our time, including audiobooks, and yet how little people read today. Isn't that strange? Sometimes the more of something you have, the less people take advantage of that. Isn't, isn't that a weird phenomenon? It is pretty strange. So why don't you make time? Read some good books. Read books about the faith. Read books about basic apologetics or advanced apologetics. It doesn't matter. Read books about whatever will help encourage you as you encourage other people. And there are some good fiction books out there too. Make time to read good books. Try your best to reduce screen time and increase reading time. Okay? So we've, we've talked about a few things there. The next one, I, I already actually talked about this one, but, but basically a life pursuing excellence is one that focuses on preparing for the battle ahead. Prepare for the battle ahead. Sure, you're not in a relationship now, but someday you're probably going to be in a relationship possibly. Well, what are you doing now to prepare for that? Prepare now. Start thinking and praying about those issues. And those of you who are 17, 16, 17 especially, if those issues are going to come up at all, you better be ready. So that when people present themselves and this, that, and the other, you can say, nope, that's not the way I'm going to go because I'm ready and I know I'm not going to go that direction. I'm not going to be attached. You know, I'm not going to be unequally yoked with an unbeliever. I'm not going to do that which dishonors the Lord. I want to honor the Lord in my conduct. Be, be preparing as you read the word and coming up with such, some, I'll call it like a, a life plan so that when those things come up, you have a plan and you won't be taken off guard. The next issue how can a person who is young pursue excellence, not just pursue excellence, but how can they live a life that makes sense? Seek to use your wealth and all that he's giving you, all that you have for the glory of God. Find opportunities to use your wealth and the opportunities that he's giving you, your time, your talents, and your resources. Is there a way you can channel those things to be used for the glory of God, for his kingdom? The Lord has blessed us definitely in America in many ways. But unfortunately, when we absorb things to ourselves, we lose sight of how we can be a blessing to others. One of the things that I'll bring up now, it's funny because me and I brought this up one time, and I'm, I don't judge people who do this, but one year, something occurred to me about birthdays. And I, I'm not fighting anybody about birthdays, but I'll tell you though, what happened. I realized that we have so much stuff. I think it might have been from me watching somebody at a birthday party. Maybe that's what happened. I, I visited a, a person's uh, par a birthday party. He was probably six or seven. And he lives in a pretty big house. His parents are wealthy. And they brought gifts to his birthday. And I was watching him as he was opening his gifts. And now keep in mind that his dad could have bought anything that everybody brought to that birthday. Better than what people brought to the birthday. And I was watching him, um, you know, just sitting there. Some days I put on a sociologist hat, even though I'm a, a chemist, physicist. But I put on a sociologist hat and look at people. I just observe. And I, I observed something interesting. It's like he opened this gift and you're like, ah, oh, that looks okay. You know, but, but it's, it wasn't up necessarily up to his taste. And I thought to myself, now, this is my conviction. Okay, I'll give you a heads up. It's my conviction. It doesn't mean you have to do it. Romans 14 says that if somebody chooses a certain thing different from what I choose on an issue that is not a, doc, a, a salvation issue, I don't need to fight them. Some people are okay with eating meat and some people are not. I'm not going to fight them. But I said, why am I buying a gift for a rich kid who's going to look at it and think, ah, you know, it's not up to the good one I have in there when there's kids don't, who don't have lunch? Why, why am I buying you a gift? Um, it's not that I want to be stingy, and that's not my intent at all, but it doesn't make any sense. Now, maybe I'm just, maybe I have a disease of hyper logic, logic thinking, maybe that's a problem. Amos, you gotta cool down, you gotta enjoy life, okay? People have told me that. But that doesn't make sense, because your dad can buy a better gift than what I bought for you, and by the way, look at your, 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 your toy rack, it's too full, why am I giving you one more thing? You're supposed to be giving them away. So. After that event, I, I, my views changed. And I know I don't owe anybody here birthday presents, but just giving you a heads up, I'm probably not buying you a birthday present. However, if you need something, I would be willing to help. That's different. But just to buy you a random present, I personally don't do that. Now, with my kids, again, that would have to be worked out. People are like, oh, your kids might be mad. Okay, we'll figure that out. But, but with individuals, if there's a need, let's meet the need. But 
If there's just formality, let's be careful. Why am I saying this? Maybe it was okay to buy gifts in abundance in 1929 and 1930. The Great Depression happened. People are, I mean, life was hard. And you get a gift for someone, it's so special. But my friends, we're so rich, it's unbelievable. Some people have so many toys, they haven't touched what, some of them for a year. So it's not meaningful to give you something that you only keep aside. I'd rather write you a handwritten letter, right? That's like gold in this day and age. I'll write you a handwritten letter and give it to you. And maybe, sure, I can give you some cash, go figure out what you want to do. That's different. But sometimes we sweat over buying gifts for people who have so much already. Our culture, we're both been blessed with so much. How can you and I take what we have and find practical ways? An opportunity comes for an overseas. Hey, guys, the church is gathering some gifts to send over to this place or that place. How willing are we to say, you know, Mom, I don't use that thing. Can you pass it on to, to the church? Or, you know, Dad, I don't use that. Can you pass it on to the church? How willing are we to give of what we have? Now, keep in mind you're young, right? So I can't necessarily tell you to give money, but you can give something, Right? And I think that might bring encouragement to your parents as well. When they recognize you're not just going to keep the, the toys to rack up dust. Some people are so rich, they have a toy room. In some countries, a toy room is the whole house for a family of eight. That's the reality. In some countries, that is someone's life. And that's the kid's toy room. So, nothing wrong with giving gifts. I've just found it to be... I'm trying to be careful. This is all new to me. How do I handle giving to somebody who already has so much? Now, I didn't grow up in a country where we gave gifts a lot at birthdays. That was abnormal. Maybe the very wealthy did that. But I just, it has troubled my heart that materialism, which is the next issue we're going to go into in a bigger scale, but materialism has to be kept in line. If you're going to pursue excellence and if you're going to be a young person that lives a life that makes sense, watch out for materialism. What do I mean by materialism? The things that are temporary. Don't allow those to run the show. I just picked up a book here that I own called The Imitation of Christ. This, this is the copy for the camp, but I also own it, and I was just flipping through some of the pages. And one of the things the author talks about is the things that should matter in your life should be things that have eternal value. That's what should carry weight in, in our lives. If, if something is to matter, we should ask, does this have eternal value? Does it go beyond my life here and now? Or is it just here and now? I haven't noticed this as much in the Midwest, but I've been to some other parts of the country and I grew up in certain circles where this is a big deal. But some people are all about the brand. All about the brand. What bag do you use? What shoes do you wear? You know, and I found that to be comforting when I came to the Midwest because not many people cared about those things. But I've seen certain pockets of culture where it's serious. Oh, you're not using a Louis Vuitton? What's wrong with you? I mean, it's like, you know, your bag is that? Come on, you gotta step it up. Okay, what's the purpose of the bag to carry things? Why does it matter what the stamp on it is? Why is this one so important? Are you ready for this? Of the richest men in the, or richest people in the world, with five of them, the top five are men, of the, of the five top five richest people, the number one, you all know Amazon, and then of course Gates was there, and Gates and Amazon bounced back and forth. So Gates, but there's a guy who is number three that has actually somewhat moved back or close to number two in a sense. And, um, and then Warren Buffett is number four, Mark Zuckerberg is number five. The guy in number three, his company makes the Louis Vuitton bags. What blows my mind is how can you be the third richest person in the world with probably over $50 billion by selling things, some of which cost $1,500 for a simple backpack? Why does that even exist? Now, again, I have nothing, that wrong, nothing against him, and if you want to have a Louis Vuitton, that's fine. But what shocks me is that people put so much value in materialism that they will put $1,500 to have LV on the backpack they're carrying. Now, again, that might sound foreign to some of you, but that's very commonplace for many people. But does that show you what the, 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 the nature of the world we live in, where value is placed on stuff? But all this stuff, I remember there was a plane crash one time, which is very sad. But when you look at the, you know, when the plane crash happened and the, the, people's luggage was scattered all over, and you saw some brand names, I saw some brand names, and I just thought to myself, wow, all of that can end in a moment. Again, somebody said, well, what do I do if I earn a million a year? I'm not going to buy a $50 backpack. Okay, sure, I'm not going to fight you about it. 
But it's just interesting that we sometimes put value and treat people more special if they have those name tags. It doesn't matter. We need to learn, and I know you guys maybe don't struggle with that, but a child pursuing excellence doesn't put value in material things to the point that they create hierarchies in society based on what letters are in your backpack or what car dropped you off at school yesterday. A car is a car. I mean, sure, it should be decent. I mean, I don't want you driving a car that you got to push every five miles. But, but, but it's not, your value is not in your car. But our world likes to focus on flashy things, right? Isn't it funny that some of these celebrities, now, of the top five people, not, none of them are quote-unquote celebrities. So, but, but, but when you look at a lot of celebrity, the, the, the American world where we like, some people focus on celebrities. What's interesting is a lot of these celebrities are trying to find their way. So you're putting your eyes and attention on someone simply because they have money when they don't even know where they're headed. They're confused. And we exalt some of them. The athletes, the movie stars, right? Maybe that is one I should actually pause on. I'm gonna add this one. If you're gonna pursue a life that, 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 uh, that, that makes sense and if you're gonna live a life that, that, that is pursuing excellence, there is a view of the biblical heroes and Jesus Christ. Those are the people that I say, I want to be like them. Not like I want to be like this superstar, whatever. Is there anything wrong with playing football as a career in and of itself? No. But if I idolize football players, make them more important than the, you know, people know about, more about some football players than they know about the heroes of the faith, then we have a problem. And some of those football players need Jesus just as anybody needs Jesus. But we somehow think that because they have talent and ability, they're in a different level. They're human beings who have just practiced a lot in something and are pretty good at it. Some of them, uh, some people still need to improve their skill, but generally most of them are okay at it. And so if, if you're going to stand out in your generation, you have to lovingly show them that your mentors and your direction does not come from the culture, does not come from the celebrities, does not come from the movie stars. It comes from those who love Jesus, those who love Jesus. Those are the ones you follow. If I was going to become a professional football player, is there anything wrong with learning from another football player? No, I can learn from them. But still, they're just someone I'm learning from to learn that football skill. Jesus is still my direction. And then you hear some of these celebrities make comments as though they know what they're saying. And I can say this because I'm older than a lot of them, especially the ones in sports. Like, what are you saying? Just because you can play basketball doesn't mean you can do anything else, my friend. I'm not saying you can't do other things, but please don't come out and be talking like, sort of make a statement that makes sense and then say nonsense and think because you can play basketball you can do that. That doesn't make any sense. But guess what? A lot of kids, they want to follow them. Oh, the celebrity said this is okay. The celebrity said there's other ways to go. The cele- oh, you can't do that. Just because you're a celebrity doesn't mean that you have everything figured out. I didn't watch the awards, but there were some awards that were given not long ago. And uh, a Christian apologist released a video about it And the reason why he released it is because a woman came on stage and just made some terrible statements, terrible claims. And the problem is not only that she made the terrible claims and the terrible statements, is that the people in the audience, everybody just clapping as though she made sense. She didn't make any sense. But because, again, I'm a celebrity, what I say must carry weight. No, it must not carry weight. You need to go figure out what matters, my friend. Yes, use the talents you've been given, and hopefully use them rightly. But don't go around speaking terribly because guess what it does it causes our young people to lose their way and unfortunately she was talking about a hot button issue i think she was talking about abortion and basically how that's part of why she could do what she did because abortion is fine and good or whatever it allowed her and i just thought you can't be saying this and if you were a christian in that event and you didn't clap i'm sure some people would have looked down on you but she came out and said that and many people thought that was just fine so we have people that are worshiping celebrities a person, a young person pursuing excellence does not worship celebrities. They call, they, they seek to follow Jesus Christ. They learn from some of these celebrities what they need to learn, depending on what field they need to learn in. So basketball, I might learn from a basketball player. But as far as what they say after that, it must be filtered through God's word. It doesn't matter who we are. God is God. And these celebrities need to understand that. So we've talked about studying God's word and getting together spontaneously. We've talked about, of course, making the time to do this. We've talked about having wealth and finding a way to give that away or finding ways to bless other people. We've talked about addressing apathy in your world. We've talked about chores at home. We need to do those with excellence. 
We talked about reading good books. We've talked about getting ready for the battle ahead. You have to study and prepare for the battle ahead now. The battle for church. Someday you're going to get married. Well, maybe get time and review those things and ask those questions to your parents, to the leaders in your groups, and make sure that you're taking counsel. Take counsel. Because that will keep you out of trouble. You've never been there before. So let's deal with this next one, which is insight. If you're going to live a life that makes sense, you must seek what? Insight. And when I'm seeking insight, I'm trying to ask somebody else to tell me about the road ahead so that I don't repeat the mistakes they made. If I went back to your age right now, there are some questions I would be asking. And if I asked those questions, my life would be somewhat, well, actually much better in certain arenas. I would ask questions about relationships. I would ask questions about this and that. And I praise God, you know, I, I, things are fine in my world, but I still know a lot of young people, uh, people my age, who are still trying to figure out the issue of relationship. They're still trying to figure it out. They haven't made sense of it. But I remember in 2008, uh, 8 January, I don't know if Eric will remember, we were actually at the gym here at Storybook, and I was asking those questions. Because I never, the whole thing of relationships had not really been an issue in my life up till that point. Where, okay, I'm, I'm almost going to be done with college here in a year or two. I'm thinking about this. And I remember telling him, okay, there's this relationship issue. How do I handle it? And so I was looking for insight from somebody who has gone before me. If you're going to pursue excellence, if you're going to do well, make time to get insight from somebody else who has gone before you. Humility is not a problem. I mean, it, it, humility just needs to be a part of our lives. We should not be proud and think, oh, no, I'm not going to ask. Then they will think I don't know. Well, you've never been there before, so why don't you ask? Mistakes are mistakes, partly because you didn't know you were going to make them when you made them. Some people are like, okay, I'm just going to go do my thing, and then when it all crashes, I'm going to say it was a mistake. How do, you, how do you orchestrate a mistake? How do you make it all lay out? Yep, I'm going to do this, do this, all these things that are terrible. I'm not going to listen to insight, and then boom, you crash. Well, that was a mistake. No, that was a bad planning on your part. And how do we reduce bad planning and mistakes? Look at those who've gone before you. The next thing after insight is education. I want to talk about education and your academic life. So let's pause for a second and then we'll come back to um, the, the chart. Okay. So education and the academic life, that's the other thing that you have to do, correct? Everybody here go to school? If you don't go to school, let me know. Talk to the State Department of Education. You need to be doing something. Or oh, homeschooled, I mean, one or the other. If you're not homeschooled and you're not going to school, what are you doing? I, where do you think you are at? It's not the wild, wild west. Okay, so here's the deal with education. Education is heavy on my heart, and I could have a whole seminar on education. I'm not going to do that today, but I want to tell you one thing is, that is a dream, and I shared this with Eric a little bit. I am inspired by the stories of people like Isaac Newton, of people like Leonard Euler, of some of these great mathematicians and scientists. I'm inspired by their stories. These people were regular human beings who applied themselves, who worked hard, and they did some things that till today are helping you and me. Some people gave of their time and their effort. I mean, I think of Blaise Pascal, who was about 17 or 18 when he invented the calculator to help, or the calculating machine to help his father, who used to do taxes and stay up all night. He helped his father. He invented that at about 17, 18. He ended up dying at the age of 39, by the way. But the unit of pressure is Pascal. How can you die at 39 and we still use the unit of pressure from the 1600s, Pascal? How can it that be possible? You must be a pretty big deal. And Pascal was also a believer and follower of Jesus Christ. And I'm encouraged by his story of how he applied himself to excellence in academics. And that is so lacking. Now, this is not all on our parents. Please, don't say, oh, my parents, it's their fault. They, they gave me this curriculum, which is making me not smarter. No, that's not what you should do. I want to tell you about a senator who lost his wife one time. I, think, I don't know if it was sudden, but whatever the case, he had a lot of kids. So you know what he had to do? He had to figure out how to educate them. He told them, all of you are going to have to learn something here. I'm going to teach you how to be disciplined and focused. And he taught them as young as, I think, six or seven. And you wake up, you do this and this. If you remember Sound of Music in the movie, that whole similar situation. This is how it's going to be done. And his kids all flew high so that his, math, his, his, his education curriculum became a curriculum that other people use now all over the country. But what he did was he taught them the importance of taking ownership. Okay, I'm going to get up. I'm going to get up at this time. I'm going to do this. I'm going to get seated. I'm going to focus. I'm going to do my work. There's a time to work. There's a time to play. And these kids started flying high. You'll be surprised at how young some of these kids are and are disciplined. 
I see some people who are high school seniors. Mom, should I do number 15? You know, uh, I don't want to do this. You're a senior. You're almost eligible to run some societies, my friend. And you're still complaining about doing number 17. How about we change that and recognize that, you know what? I'm, I'm not young. I'm pretty old. I need to step it up. When I was in, in, in seventh grade, we had to go to boarding school. Not because I was a bad kid, but, but, but we had to go to boarding school because that's what the majority of people did, which is another day's topic we can dissect sometime. But one of the things I will tell you is that in my seventh grade year, I had to take 17 subjects with 17 notebooks without my parents, be responsible for having all 17 notebooks up to date, or you get in serious trouble, spanking or other things, you get in serious trouble with those 17 subjects and a lot of us, now I, I can say this because I wasn't number one in the class in high school. In elementary school I was, but not in high school. In high school, I wasn't top ten, but, um, but I can tell you this. Most of us had our notes up to date for six years in a row without our parents. Six years in a row. So from seventh grade to twelfth grade, we're in boarding school. We had to cater for ourselves. I'm not saying you have to go to boarding school, but my point is, this is the point I'm making with the point I'm telling you. You're much more capable than you even know. Sometimes you haven't tried. You haven't tested yourself to see that you are capable of getting up, of getting your schoolwork done, of doing your schoolwork with excellence. You're capable of it. But you live in a country where it's okay to be lazy. And that's where you say, I'm not going to be lazy. I'm going to be different. America has so many safety nets and the problem with the safety nets is that it creates opportunities for people to fail, fail, and fail, and be okay. In many countries of the world, when I, so, and again, my example, when I was in fifth grade, and you can ask Mr. Giresh also for fun, because India and Nigeria are so similar that I actually sometimes, I'm like, seriously, they're too similar. So if I went to India, I would feel like I'm, I'm, I'm in Nigeria in many ways. But in fifth grade, we took standardized tests. Now, this is not saying that this is right. What I'm about to tell you, I don't think it's necessarily right, but this was what I had to do. In fifth grade, I had to take an exam. Based on how I scored on that exam, it would determine what high school I ended up in. Based on what high school I ended up in, it would determine if I ever went to college. But it all goes back to that fifth grade exam. If you don't take it in fifth grade, you can take it in sixth grade, or you can do one or the other. But after sixth grade, you take that exam, you do terrible. Now, back then, we didn't have as many private schools, but you do terrible, you don't get into a good school, it most likely means you're not going to have a very good 12th grade cumulative exam result, which means that you're probably not going to go to a good university, or even if you did, you might end up studying something. Like you, in Nigeria, you can be undecided, so we all had to have a major in mind in 10th grade. So when you say, this is my major, Instead of them giving you medicine, for example, I want to be a doctor, they would actually say, ah, no, nah, it's not good enough, biology or zoology. That's what they would do to you, and that's it. Because medicine is a terminal degree. It's one degree in Nigeria. In America, it's, it's, it's a post-undergraduate degree. You get a first degree, and then you get medical school. In Nigeria, it's one thing. Med school is one thing. And they can deny you that based on how they feel about some things from that cumulative exam, which is only given once a year. So I grew up in a, cult in a culture where Safety nets were missing. If you missed the fifth, sixth grade safety net, you're in trouble. Guess what that did to us? We woke up. We, we, we were serious. Because we knew that our window was short. Do you see what I'm saying? Now, that's reality. Reality is that if you don't do some things right, you get in serious trouble. That's reality. The United States reality is that, oh, I could keep playing around. But that's not reality. You see the problem with the U.S.? We are not living in reality. We're living in a false reality. And the false reality we're living in is to think that, oh, I can pick and choose and do whatever I want. Sure, you can do that at the Chinese buffet, but you can't do that with life. Choices have consequences. You can choose your choices. You can't choose your consequences of your choices. You can't play around with school and then when you're 19 be like, okay, I want to be a surgeon now. I'm going to start working hard today. Well, you got to start building the skill then, except if you built it from earlier on. So we can dissect education more. I'll probably do a whole book on this again sometime. But this issue is huge. So my message to you on education for a young person pursuing excellence is I want you to treat it like this. I know that there's so much comfort. I know that there's so many safety nets. But I'm still going to work hard as though they're not there. Did you hear that, what I said? 
I know those things are there, but I'm going to live my life somehow assuming they're not there so I don't get lazy and complacent. And back to the apathy again, you see? So please, with your schoolwork, seek to apply yourself. And I'm very sorry that we have to teach you some topics that don't seem to make sense. I'm sorry that we have to teach you some things on polynomials that you don't care about. I'm sorry. But you just try. You apply. You do your best. You, 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 you make... I mean, seriously, what else are you going to do? Go on strike? I mean, seriously, what, what, who's going to listen to you? I'm not doing that. I'm not doing factory. I'm sorry. You got to do it. So why not find a way to do it with some joy? Isn't that the best way to do it? If you got to do something, why not do it well? Now, when you finish with your K-12, sure, go to college and study something. I don't know, go study whatever, German music or whatever, which is not the best thing to study, but go study whatever you want to study. Uh, don't study German music. But, but my point is, you, you go and you study something that makes sense, but at that point, you can have your passions to the max. But right now, if you got to do it, why not do it well? So when you finish having that Bible study with a bunch of your friends, why not factor some polynomials after that? So that would be ideal. Uh, this is like when Amos puts on the lens of ideal. He walks into a room with a bunch of math books and Bibles. That's ideal. Uh, but anyways, I, I, some of it sounds like a joke, but some of it I'm serious. If you're struggling with school, why not get together and help one another figure it out? What's wrong with that? Oh, you're going to think I'm nerd. Who cares what they think? Because that's what we had to do, by the way. We spent time, we studied the Bible together, but we also studied schoolwork together. Some of the people I studied with were pretty smart people, and some of them now are professors at Yale and whatever, but we, it all started back then. And, and we still have pictures. You see us in our classroom, studying hard. And some of them kept up with that intensity, and now they get the opportunity to teach um, all over the world. So, apply yourself now. Because, not just, don't just apply yourself because you want to do well, but because by applying yourself to your academics, you are helping somebody else. Did you guys hear that? When you apply yourself to your academics, you are helping somebody else. Because someday, that skill which allows you then to become a doctor, for example, will help somebody. So, I think selfishness, and again, this is an opportunity for us to reflect on our lives and see where we need to tweak things. But I'm selfish when I don't give my all. Because I'm not thinking about the fact that giving my all helps other people. I'm selfish when I don't give my all. So that means I need to repent of selfishness. And I need to look at the books and go, OK, I'm going to give you a chance. And if you're struggling, my friends, I'll tell you one practical thing about education. This is not 1525. You don't have to stick to the same textbook to learn the concept. How about go online and look for how to learn it? What's wrong with that? You see what I'm saying? If it was 1525, there's only one book and one book alone. If you didn't get it, you don't get it. There's 50,000 different classrooms on YouTube. You can watch the lecture from all these different people. So if you really wanted to get it, you can get it. So the days of getting C's and being OK have expired. I'm sorry. That's official. No more C's. Uh, we strive to give our best. And our generation is not calling you to like get a Nobel Prize. They're just asking you to pass the class, right? So. This was the thing I was going to tell you about education earlier on, which is that if I can inspire you to think more about applying yourself, one of the things I've realized is uh, with education, the Nobel Prize, I, I told Eric I'd love to see things in education. One of the things in, with, with education is what if we taught kids about Nobel Prize winners as far as the awards, I mean, the, the reason they won the Nobel Prize, like in chemistry or physics, and then give the child an opportunity to see why the person got the Nobel Prize so that maybe they can begin to think of how they can do better than that person did. I repeat, you know why this person won the Nobel Prize. Now you're thinking constantly, how can I improve upon what that person did? Now, some of you are going to go into the sciences. Some of you are going to go into the social sciences, whatever. It doesn't matter. What matters is how can we do better than those who have come before us? So in all of your education, add that dimension to it. Number nine, our church life. A child who is pursuing excellence takes the church seriously. I, I, don't, um, I don't understand all of the politics in, in American sports systems, but somehow the value of the church has been lowered in society. And I know some of you here have been caught up in it. It's not your fault, so don't go home and say, he picked on me. But somehow the church has not made it stand so clear that people can schedule things on Sundays and not even be worried about it. 
How do we call coaches to encourage other people to realize, can we not do that on Sunday? Again, some of you have to do it. I, I, you know, that, that, well, you, 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 you have a team that maybe plays on other days and then they play on Sunday mornings. But here's my concern. And maybe you guys will see why I'm concerned. We talked about the fact that people are living lives that don't make sense. Everybody get that? We, we've talked about that. So you have a child who's not pursuing excellence, who's trying to figure out what life is about. And the one opportunity he has, possibly on Sunday morning with his family, to hear some truth is then taken away. Well, how is he going to be reminded of the truth? Now, I'm not calling you to be a Sunday, Sunday Christian, but my point is some people, that Sunday morning is an opportunity, is a window that they really need, but now it's not even guaranteed for everybody. And the other level is some of you here want to be involved in the church, but you get certain jobs and they schedule you on Sunday mornings. Or some of you want, you, 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 you get a job and and I'll tell you, I'm a little radical on this job part. I'll explain what I mean in a second. You get a job, and they schedule you on Wednesday night. And you told them, I'm sorry, I would really like to not work on Wednesday because I want to be at youth group. Here's what I mean about being radical on this. If you're like Daniel, this is my theory. And if I'm proven wrong and you lose your job, Eric has my number. Give me a call, and I will see what I can do to plead and beg that you get your job back. But if you're like Daniel... My understanding is that if you are so exceptional in your job and you plead to have Sunday mornings and Wednesdays off and the people say, sure, you can have it off, and then they start scheduling you on it, I would politely approach them. This is, I'm saying if the church matters this much to me as a young person, I would go to them and politely say, I'm so sorry, I do like making these sandwiches, but I cannot make them on Wednesday night because it's my opportunity to be a part of the body of Christ. And if they fire you, praise the Lord. That's why I said it's a little radical. But here's my point. If you're so exceptional, it is hard to fire you. When people are exceptional, it is hard to fire them because you know what you're missing out. Where am I getting this example from? When the king threw Daniel into the lion's den, he could have just gone and slept. But what did he do? He couldn't sleep. And then the first thing he runs, Daniel, did, did your God save you? Like, I, you gotta live, Daniel. Don't die. But Daniel was a follower of God and wasn't gonna back down. If you live like Daniel, that should blow your employee's mind, uh, employer's mind to the point that they will not easily just say, yeah, get out of here. And if they say, get out of here, guess what? They make sandwiches somewhere else. I don't know. But now let's even go to the root. Why do some people need seven jobs? I mean, I've met people that have jobs. They want to be busy every minute. Why? They're taking LSC courses. They're busy, busy, busy. Why? What are you running away from? What am I running away from? Do you see my point? Why can't people just, this is enough, this pays the bills, things are okay, why do we need to get so busy that we miss out on our church life? And I've watched many young people, unfortunately, miss out on the things of God because they bought into the busyness of society. So if you're going to be a young person pursuing excellence, watch out for the busyness factor. Don't be busy just to be busy. Be busy doing the Lord's work. Be, be, be tactful. I mean, Bill Gates was your age, by the way, when he was programming. And eventually they had to pull him out of school for a semester to program for the government or for some department in the state. I mean, he was about your age, right? The point I'm trying to make from that story is he found an opportunity and he flourished in that opportunity. And of course, some of you know him. If you don't know him, it's the guy who started Microsoft. And, you know, he was a young fellow, went to Harvard and dropped out because, I mean, the guy was ahead of his time. But... And I tell people, please don't go to college and drop out. Only Harvard. Make sure you go to Harvard first. Then you drop out. It helps. Um, I'm kidding. Don't drop out. But it's just funny because Zuckerberg, Facebook, he also dropped out of Harvard. It's like, oh, these dropouts from Harvard, right? They, they seem to find a niche. But, but the reason, there's reason why he dropped out, which you can read in his books or whatever. But the point is, what, is, what have you been wired to do? Some of you here should not be working in a sandwich store. Some of you here should be doing some things with your hands that will provide an income. Maybe it's selling something with reasonable, with parental guidance and reasonability, I guess, on Amazon. Maybe selling some apples on Amazon, I don't know. 
doing something else. But why do we limit ourselves to think, well, I got to work in that store and this, and then you find yourself working on Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and you're busy. You, you lose your whole life. And then you go to college, and then you graduate college, and you're like, okay, well, that was intense. I'm 23 now. Okay, let's go get married. And you didn't have a life all those years. Why, why don't we step back and be more tactful? Yeah, I'll take this job, but it must not violate these following things. Can, can we be more principled and say, this is it. I will not work this job if it violates these things. Because guess what? You might gain the whole world and what? Lose your soul. What will it profit a man to gain the whole world? Your bank account is big, but you just, you, you're nowhere to be found with the Lord. So let's seek opportunities. As far as the sports one, I don't know that I have a solution to that. My prayer is, I, I don't think that's going to change in America, unfortunately. And some people maybe will find themselves traveling this, that, and the other. And some teams I know might have a chaplain or this and that. But if you find yourself in some of that situation and you're not the thermostat and you're not determining the temperature of the group around you, sometimes it might be that you pull out. If you're being influenced and you're, 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 you're backsliding because of all of that. Ideally, we plead. Like, well, Eric Little, I, I don't even remember his full story, but I know Chariots of Fire where he said he wasn't going to run on Sunday. But that was just one example. Oh, oh, I think on the Sabbath, it's been so long, I, I should go watch that again. But the point is, there are times where we have to make tough decisions. Let's be ready to make those decisions. It's not always going to be easy. And then please, if any of you here becomes a coach, do your best. Do all you can to give kids a chance to stay plugged in to where they're growing spiritually. So we've de dealt with about nine things. I'm going to end with one more thing as far as practical application. It's about 545. We'll give you guys time to have any discussions. We can definitely dissect some of these more. I'll probably maybe take some comments before you leave. Why don't we end with number 10, which is something I've already brought up before that I'll bring up again. And that's the issue of relationships. A person who is pursuing excellence, a person who is a uh, diary of a young person pursuing excellence, a person who is seeking to live a life that makes sense, does not just go into relationships. You don't just go into relationships because everybody's going into relationships. You don't just go into relationships because you want somebody to make you feel good. You go into relationships with people. If you're going to, this is, now I'm speaking again to prepare you for the time when it will come for you to be thinking about marriage and the possibility. But a relationship that is serious. Uh, some of you, again, are very young, but there's nothing wrong with at least dropping a, a bullet in your ears, to, you know, something to think about. Some people date or go into relationship or court or whatever word we call it, the pre-marriage stage, because if they don't, they look odd because they feel they want to hear good things from somebody. Like, tell me. I want to hear you tell me how beautiful I am. I want you to tell me how awesome I am, those kind of things, which brings us to a root problem, our identity crisis. If we're pursuing excellence, we need to examine our identity and make sure that our identity is in the right place. But remember the first thing we discussed today? What's the first step? I recognize my wretchedness and my need for Jesus Christ. And when I'm saved and when I've surrendered my life to Jesus Christ, there is a way for me to live. And I use my reference point with my identity with Christ first. Not my beauty, not, my, well, not the lady's beauty, not the man's handsomeness, not the money you have, or not all these fleeting things we have. My identity is in Christ. That is solid. When we think about the different things that we put our identity in sometimes, and there's some people who, yeah, they thought they were beautiful, and then they dated somebody, and then the person told them that they were not beautiful, and then their life was ruined. And some guys feel like they failed. And I've watched all this drama. And unfortunately, I've watched so many marriages end over the past 10 years of being in the U.S., since I've been in the U.S., and it's really caused me to think again of how I can encourage solid marriages down the road by calling people early to think about what they're doing. At one point in like eight years, there was eight divorces, and I said, this has got to stop. What is the deal? A lot of them in the church, people in the church. I'm not talking about people who are not necessarily following Jesus. This is a group in the church, and it's like, what are we doing? We have to be careful. Oh, I didn't know he would do this, or he likes watching TV too much, or whatever. It's like, okay. If we're going to say a covenant till death do us part, we got to mean what we say. And so I say all of this again because some of you here will be married probably in the next five to ten years. Some of you are like, oh boy, don't bring that up. I'm just saying the truth. Some of you are going to be married in the next five to ten years. Are you preparing for it? Or are you just going to roll into it? Like it's just going to be all perfect and fine. And the reason why I bring this up is, girls, remember who you are in Christ. Boys, remember who you are in Christ. Walk the, the course. Walk the road. Walk as you ought to walk. Let Christ be, let your identity be in Christ. 
Not in what other people say, as much as they can be saying nice things, but let your identity be in Christ. What do I recommend when I talk about relationships? If there's a person, I'll tell you one secret. If there's a person who has a group of friends, like a guy, uh, uh, Logan, for example, might have a group of guys around him that are holding him firmly. That, and a girl came and asked, oh, what do you think? I have this guy who I think I want to date. I want to know who's around him. And if the people around him, I'm like, oh, some solid people. Okay, this, this looks good. This is a good start. But if you ask, if I ask, and oh, yeah, he works at this place, doesn't really have any friends. Okay, that's like red flag number one. Okay, how, how do we, what are the connections around him that can keep him in line? If he doesn't have that, okay, yeah, it's all nice, but we don't know what's going to happen next. We don't know if he's following the Lord. He says he's following the Lord, but we don't have any way to even know any of that. Marriage is a serious issue. Relationships are a serious issue. And ultimately what matters is that we find people who are seeking to serve the Lord, who are surrounded by other people who are seeking to serve the Lord, and we have this person who is seeking to serve the Lord, who is surrounded by people who are seeking to serve the Lord. Now you have those two people, that relationship makes sense. When you don't have solid fellowships that are governing the lives of both people, now we just is all warm fuzzies. It's all just, oh, they feel good, whatever. That, that doesn't help anybody in the long run. And two people getting married. 1 Corinthians 7, by the way, if any of you is planning to get married soon, make sure you read 1 Corinthians 7. Some of you are like, I don't want to write that. He's going to think I'm getting married. Don't worry, just memorize it and do it later. 1 Corinthians 7, it says that let him who's single, you know, stay single, let him who's married, do whatever. But he's saying, yeah, sure, even if you're married, live as though you're single in the sense of a singleness of vision. If I'm all out for Christ, and that other person, oh, if somebody's all out for Christ and the other person is all out for Christ, now we got a team. We're moving forward, advancing the kingdom of God, because ultimately the kingdom of God is what matters, not how I feel about what somebody said to me. That's not what life is about. That's not what marriage is about. But I think that's where our problem is, is that we've lost the bearing of the point of marriage. It doesn't have a point for many people. And why am I saying that point first? So then the dating doesn't have a point either. Do you see what I'm saying? When the marriage has lost its bearing, the thing leading to the marriage has also lost its bearing, and now we have a society of people who are just looking for someone to make them feel good. And that does not work out, my friends, in the long run. Children get hurt in the process. So why don't we encourage one another to grow in learning these issues? So Nathan comes and says, oh, I, I think I found somebody I want to date or whatever. Ask him the hard questions. Who, you know, the, the person love the Lord, this and that. Well, they kind of do. They go to church seven times a year. You know, okay, no. Do they love the Lord? And, and if they don't, is it, well, Nathan, what's up? Well, well I'm going, I'm going to, they're going to get saved. Okay, well, that's a different conversation. We, again, they can get saved, sure. But I'm just saying, just walk with caution in it. Be careful with it. And they might not be saved, and they might get saved. But sometimes people actually stay on the outside until that person gets saved, and then they have the conversation. Now, am I saying that people can get saved after dating and so on? No, it can happen. But as a rule, we don't want to establish, like, just go try date anybody random. Does that make sense? We have to have the guidelines, and sometimes God works through, you know, again, it's not what his word says. His word says, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. But somebody, that might have happened, but I don't go into my life saying, I want to date an unbeliever someday. Does that make sense? So anyways, I think I've bitten the dead horse. But, but you get the point. Vision, direction, and those issues are important when you're talking of relationship with somebody else. What is the person's vision and direction? Does the person have any direction in their lives? Why am I saying this even more so for your generation? Because of the lack of vision that you guys might be plagued with due to the high level of distractions. You have so many things to distract you. People don't have time to have a vision or direction for life. And so, girls, if a boy comes to you and says, oh, I want to date you, ask him, what's your vision for life? He might look at you weird, but just say, please, can you go think about it and come back and we'll talk? Because if he has no vision for life, tell him, I got to go. Just don't even talk more, okay? If there's no vision, like, what are we going to do? Okay, you wanna, you're asking me to date you. Well, where are we going? I don't know. We're just together, I guess. No, I don't want to just be together. I want to be working with someone who's going somewhere. And I'm serious, boys. We got to step it up with our vision. We got to step it up with our direction. If we're going to lead families, if we're going to lead people, then we better lead ourselves, right? A man wrote a book called Make Your Bed. 
which is you could add that as one of your things. Do you guys, anybody know the book? Make your bed, right? And he talked. He's an admiral, and he was he gave a speech at University of Texas, and he, and he talked about the fact of in the in the in the Navy SEALs. They make their beds, right? Which is funny because in boarding school we did the same. I actually think uh, some of our boarding school practices were copied from the military. But we made our bed, woke up at 5.30, you had 5.30, 5.35 to pray, 5.35 to this time to get ready, 6 o'clock do your duty, 7 o'clock in the, whatever. All laid out for us. And we had to make our beds and they were inspected every day. So every day I got a chance to make my bed for six years or so. Made my bed, right? So I got a lot of experience in bed making. So I was telling my wife, I said, I feel so bad for some people growing up in America. They haven't made their bed over a hundred times. We made our bed so many times. So you get to make your bed. But why did he say they should make their beds? He says, because when you make your bed, you've accomplished a task for the day. You go out and you might have a terrible day, but when you come back, you have a bed that is made. And you go, yes, at least I accomplished that today. So at least you have one thing going for you, right? Some of you are like, you, you haven't seen my room. That's okay. I don't need to see it. Just go fix it this weekend. So my point is, we need to, we need to start, if we're going to lead, if men are going to lead, then we need to make our bed. We need to be able to find our shoes. We need to, and I'm not saying all the guys' rooms are, I'm sure it's girls' rooms too. Everybody's room can be put in order. But we all need to, right? And if your room is in order, well done. And I need to go make sure my, you know, make sure my house is in order. Order is important, but it's lacking. Part of a person who has a vision is this order. So do you have order? Are you reading the word? Are you studying the word? Then you are possibly a candidate for a lady who is thinking of marriage. Because you have some direction. You have some guidance from God's word. If you don't have those issues, you can't lead and you can't do much. So let's take in more of God's word. Because again, we have Facebook or I guess some people call it fake book. We have fake book. We have brag book. It's almost like bragging, right, sometimes. And there's nothing wrong with sharing the, the things that the Lord is doing through us. Praise the Lord. But if that's all I'm doing is just scrolling Facebook and this and that, I won't have vision in my life. So I need to have vision. And I need to lead my life first before I can lead with another woman. Young men, some of you are going to be the husbands and fathers of tomorrow in the next few years. Let's get it right. And let's blaze that trail. This is the diary of a child who's pursuing excellence. And young women, don't, don't lower your bar. Where just don't, don't, even, don't, don't, don't lower your bar because this one seems different. This guy seems different. Ask the hard questions gently and love and all of that. Find his friends. Who are his friends? Who are the people he hangs around? And your generation, unfortunately, is growing up with so much of society breaking down that you need more of God's word and more caution because of that. When I grew up, male and female was not even a debate. You have that debate. How are you going to handle it? If, 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 if we're going to lead, blaze the trail, if we're going to shine the light of Jesus Christ, then we need to be in relationships with people that have direction. Apathy, let's tell it to go away. And let's say, I want to live with diligence and I want to live a life that makes sense. Because, number one, what was the first reason why we should live life that makes sense? Because of the brevity of life, which we'll, we'll wrap up tomorrow on that. Number two, because Jesus is coming back. And number three, because you were created, therefore you have a purpose which involves living a life that makes sense. There's three reasons, at least, why we should live life that makes sense. Each one of those is a whole message on its own. My